Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. And thank you for allowing us to do work that we find meaningful. Thank you for giving us the most valuable commodity you have, your attention. We promise to do our very best to give you a return on it. Today we have our commodities guru, Rick Rule. We're going to pick his brain on the resource sector and your companies. Rick, thank you for coming back on the show. Steve, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to your audience. Uh, always a pleasure is on this side of the table, sir. Uh, and I got to say, I'm really excited about uh, our next boot camp coming up. We're about five weeks out. It is the Prospector uh, Generators Prospect Generators Boot Camp. Uh, and if this one is like any of your last boot camps, it has been uh, uh, quite nice to our bank accounts. What can we expect at this boot camp? Well, let's start at the very top. Uh, unlike or pardon me, exactly like every other educational product that Rural Investment Media has sold, this comes with an absolutely gold-plated money-back guarantee. There is no subscription-based service uh, or tuition-based course that I know of that has a gold-plated money-back guarantee. What that means is that if we don't produce content that you believe is worth more than what we charge you to receive it, you get your money back. Nobody else does that. How can we do it? Well, because we've been doing it for 30 years, we're pretty good at doing it. We have great keynote speakers, and the Prospect Generators Bootcamp is no exception. We will introduce our listeners to uh, Steve Enders, who is, uh, in addition to uh, being a professor of exploration geology at the Colorado School of Mines, the former head of worldwide exploration for Phelps Dodge, then the largest copper mining company in the world, and the head of worldwide exploration for Newmont the largest gold company in the world. Steve will talk about prospect generation from the point of view both of the small company, small companies, pardon me, that generate exploration projects, but also more importantly, from the point of view of the buyers, the major mining companies that provide the capital to the junior explorers. There could be no better keynote speaker at a prospect generators conference than somebody who has been the chairman of small prospect generators while also being uh, the uh, head of worldwide exploration for two of the largest mining companies in the world. Because, by the way, he's been a university professor for years, he has the ability to impart this knowledge on a broad based, you know, on a broad basis, because he's been doing it for geology students and commerce students for many, many, many years. Let's talk about prospect generation, too, for those listeners of yours who don't know what it means. The prospect generator is a special form of exploration company. It's a company that uses its intellectual capital, uh, be it technical knowledge or specific commercial expertise in parts of the world, to generate exploration targets, propose a thesis, and then test that thesis with other people's money. This isn't sole risk exploration. Don't think of this as buying a lottery ticket. Uh, think of it as producing a bag of 30 lottery tickets where you own 30% of each ticket, somebody else owns 70% of each ticket, but everybody else puts up all the money. You get paid for successful efforts. You don't get punished for unsuccessful efforts. While it's not as sexy as sole risk exploration, the probabilities of success are dramatically higher. When I was in university, many, many years ago, uh, I was taught that uh, it takes 3,000 mineralized anomalies to find a mine. In other words, the probability of success in soul risk exploration at the bottom of the pyramid is one in 3,000. I have participated in 70 prospect generators, more or less, in my 50 years of the business, and I participated now in 23 economic discoveries which is to say my success rate in prospect generation is 23 out of 70, whereas the expectation of success would have been one in 3,000. You will understand then why I am focused on the front end of exploration with regards to the prospect generators. Uh, we will have four exhibitors there, each of which are prominent in my own account, uh, and each of which I would suggest are worth substantially more than they're selling for, never mind the upside associated with the exploration boom, which I suspect occurs over the next five years. 
So I'm highly confident that we are going to deliver uh, a boot camp that is on par with our great uranium boot camp, our silver boot camp, our royalty and streaming boot camp. You know, every boot camp we've done has been very, very, very well attended. And everyone has been successful in the sense that with an ironclad or gold-plated money back guarantee, we've only had to refund less than one-third of 1% 1 of the tuitions that we've charged. That's a pretty good track record. And uh, I can attest to that. It, uh, I love your boot camps. Can't get enough of them. And for $99, and you can watch them as many. If you can't make the uh, April 20th date, then um, uh, you can watch it as many times as you want. Um, and we also have your Boca Raton Symposium coming out. I've, I've done the uh, virtual one the last couple of times. This will be my first one where I can actually uh, go out there. The missus and I, we got our uh, tickets. I'm going to be doing interviews. Super excited about this one. At, uh, looking at the resort, Callie had uh, wonderful things to say about it. What, what can we expect at the uh, Rural Symposium this year? Well, since you started with the resort, let's start there. Uh, it's owned by Mel Michael Dell of Dell Computers. Uh, he spent a billion four and counting. Uh, this is a hotel with half a mile of intercoastal canal waterfront and half a mile of Atlantic Ocean waterfront. It sits on 245 acres in Boca Raton. Uh, in the winter, uh, these rooms turn for $1,100 each, and we'll be able to turn them to our attendees for $310 each. This is, without a doubt, the most spectacular conference venue I have ever operated in. Oops. Uh, Sorry. sorry about that. Is that the map? Uh, no, you have URNM. Oh, U -R -N -M. geez, I'm sorry. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong one. <laughs> su suffice it to say, uh, the resort is absolutely spect spectacular. But that's not the reason you come. Uh, the reason you come has been because we've been doing live investment symposiums for 30 years. We know how. And we put on the best mining investment symposium on the planet, bar none. Once again, a gold-plated money-back guarantee. Of course, I would prefer all of the people who want to come to attend in person. There's lots of nonverbal communication that occurs coming in person. Imagine yourself following Robert Friedland or Ross Beatty or Adam Lundeen around the exhibit floor, seeing what booths they stop in front of, listening to the questions that they ask. Uh, engaging other attendees, many of whom are very successful veteran natural resource investors, uh, in discussion. Uh, the in-person experience is very hard to duplicate. Of course, uh, as an in-person attendee, you'll have access to the recorded version of the conference for a year so that you can refresh your memory time and time again. If you are incapable of attending for whatever reason, you can attend via live stream. Uh, live stream gives you the same access to the recordings for a long time, and it gives you the ability to get all of the real uh, information, all of the real presentations from the conference. Of course, without the informal ability to follow Robert Friedland as an example uh, around the exhibit hall. The live attendees also have the optional privilege of attending the attendee boat crews. There is an additional charge for that, but we have a boat that holds 400 of our closest friends that goes up and down the intercoastal canal with all of the speakers present. You'll have the ability, as an example, to visit with Nomi Prins, to visit with uh, 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 Jim Rickards. Jim, 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 Jim Rickards. Thank you. I was looking for Jim Rickards' name or Grant Williams or any of those people. It's a spectacular, spectacular opportunity. What we do at the conference is now something that to us is pretty moat, rote, but it's to everybody else uh, difficult to duplicate. We have some of the best macro people in the world, the big picture thinkers, the Rickards, the Nomi Prins, the Daniela DiMartino Booths, the Doug Casey's, uh, uh, the Grant Williams, people who give you a wonderful view of the world, but they give it to you uh, I would say from a point of view that you wouldn't get from, you know, CNBC or ABC. Once we're done with that, 
uh, we have some of the best analysts in the natural resource business, not people who flunked out as retail analysts or flunked out as crypto analysts, but really people who've been making money in the natural resource business for 30 years. So if you agree with the worldview that's espoused, we have people who will tell you how to make money out of it. Importantly, we have something called the living legends. These are entrepreneurs who have built more than one multi-billion dollar mining company from scratch. They will tell you how it's done. They will tell you how the lessons that they've learned building multi-billion companies have made them better investors. And they'll tell you how to become a better investor yourself. Where the rubber really meets the road, Steve, is our exhibitors. Uh, unlike any other investment conference that I'm aware of, uh, exhibition at our conference is by invitation only. And we only invite public company exhibitors that are owned in accounts owned and managed by us. Now, sadly, there's no guarantee that because I got buy a stock, it goes up. But the guarantee is that every single exhibitor has been vetted. Uh, if that weren't enough, uh, all of this comes with a gold-plated money-back guarantee. Whether you come in person, which would be my preference, uh, or you attended live stream, uh, joining more than a thousand people who attended by live stream last year, you will have access to these great speakers. You'll have access to the living legends. You'll have access to discussing either live or online all of the material that you got with other investors. And you'll have the ability to revisit the recordings time and time again. And believe me, in the four days of the conference, you will not be able to absorb all the information <laughs> that we attempt to feed you. You will need to come back and review the recordings frequently. Awesome. I look forward to it. Okay, here's the map. Uh, this is it. Uh, here's the resort right here, right on the beach. It looks like yep. it's walking distance to the beach. That's pretty incredible. I'm, uh, I'm excited about this one. This is going to be a lot of fun. Your wife will thank you for this, Steve. Uh, she will absolutely thank you for this. To the extent that she's interested in the conference, we'll have a lot of stuff for her. To the extent that she's not, there's beaches, there's pools, there's massage. There is more stuff to do than you could shake a stick at. Uh, my my own wife likes the conference, but at the end of four days, she said, you know, couldn't this be a six-day conference? You know. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, look forward to it. There are links in the pinned comment below, and uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, very cool. All right. Um, let's uh, get on to the questions here. We got a lot of them. Uh, we're going to try to get through as many as we can. Uh, Chris is talking about, he says, Rick, which companies and or sectors will you be focused on if and when we have another great financial crisis like we did in 2008? It really depends on the um, performance of the sectors, uh, which is to say those sectors that I think uh, demonstrate or enjoy, if that's the right phrase, uh, the biggest decline in price relative to their value. My suspicion is that if we have a collapse of the type that the gentleman is discussing, that the government's way out of that collapse will be what it has been in the past, which is to say increased liquidity. If that's true, uh, the most dramatic proportional response should be in gold or silver. Whether or not gold or silver is where I choose to go really depends on how badly it gets pummeled. That is to say, the sector that gets hurt the worst is probably the, sec the sector I'll focus on. Steve, as you know, uh, my favorite sector uh, in terms of cash in, cash out is the oil and gas business. And to the extent that the oil and gas business got hurt substantially, uh, I would love to be in the oil and gas business. But the, the question itself presupposes that I understand the extent of the carnage that occurs in the markets, which I don't. Okay, so if we have another 2008, <clears throat> last time our bank thinkers uh, invented something in November 2008 called QE, quantitative easing, and uh, they could repeat that. And if they do, precious metals should uh, um, respond. Um, and there might even be a pullback in oil and gas like there was before, which would create another opportunity. Correct. I, I will pay attention to whatever sector and whatever companies I think exhibit the best relationship between price and value. 
Okay. All right, let's go on to uranium. Uh, something's happened that hasn't happened in a while with me on uranium. I started getting hate mail again. And uh, I guess when the price <laughs> went up to $109 and then went down to 90, uh, that instituted some anger. And uh, it's starting to make me wonder if, if maybe we have another buying opportunity. And Wolfgang is asking, he says, uh, what is the reason for the mismatch between spot price and asset value? I, he says 14%. I thought I caught 15% one day. Uh, what do you see going on with uranium in the, um, uh, in the uh, spot price market? Well, the, the spot price market is very liquid. Uh, it, one could argue, given the trading volume of spot, that spot is actually a more reflective <laughs> than spot, which is to say the spot market probably ought to be renamed the sprot market. Uh, because the spot market itself has become highly illiquid. For one thing, more trades are taking place in the term market, which is important. From the other thing, the liquidity isn't there in the spot, in the spot market, precisely because Sprott bought 50 million pounds of uranium. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's one important characteristic. It is, uh, I think, increasingly important for uranium equity investors to understand that the spot market is becoming less and less relevant. And what's becoming more and more relevant is the term market. Like you, I'm delighted to see hate mail around the uranium trade. What that means is that the second part of the bull market will be more attainable, which is to say cheaper for more people. But the thing I had to say about the term market uh, probably requires more discussion, if you might permit me that time. Of course. Uh, the term market is a facility where uh, producer and consumers can get together and lock in specified uh, quantities of material over five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever the contract is, that has at least a reference point, a minimum, a, a minimum price with a maximum price that's established by various criterion. This is important particularly for the producers, because unlike any other mined commodity that I know of, you have price certainty around volume for a substantial period of time. Uh, in every other commodity that I know about, with the exception of the futures market, which generally has a two-year fuse, producers have no idea what they're going to sell their product for. In the uranium business, a producer can lock in a minimum price for a specified quantity of material for up to 15 years in duration. This means, as an example, if the uh, counterparty uh, on the term contract is an investment grade counterparty, that in effect, you have an instrument that you can take to the bank. You can show the bank that you can not only produce uranium, but you can sell it for a specified price. This gives the bank much more certainty that you're gonna pay back the loan, which should lower your cost of capital. This also makes it much easier for equity analysts like myself to do free cash flow forecasts in the, for, in the fu future years because you understand something about the selling price that they're going to receive for their commodity. To the extent that you see a substantial amount of the uranium trade move from the spot market to the term market, what you're going to see is price certainty in uranium that is better than it is in any other mined commodity. With the uranium market, as I've said on your show before, the easy money has been made. It was that move from $20 a pound to $100 a pound, and the moves in the stocks from hated to tolerated and then to be of interest. The sure money is what's ahead of us. The ability of the Chemicos, the Kazatom Proms, the Next Gens, uh, the companies like that to lock in uh, sales volumes for a long period of time with counterparties like Ontario Power, China General Nuclear, the Southern companies, Duke Power. This is something that we haven't seen in any other commodity at any other point in time in history. The it, it, It's going to take us two or three years to learn how to do this because these term contracts are opaque. The companies don't disclose any more than they absolutely have to for competitive purposes. They don't want to do that. So what you have to do, what I had to do with Cameco last quarter was look back at total pounds sold, uh, total <laughs> total price received. In other words, I had to 
sort of reconstruct the difference between the term price, the purchase price, uh, and the spot price of uranium. What I think is going to happen, Steve, over the next three years is that the companies that are more forthcoming with information will have higher share prices at a lower cost of capital because of the certainty of their revenues in the out years. And I think that the market is going to force, particularly the smaller companies, to make fairly explicit disclosures uh, around the contents of their term uh, contracts. And I think this is going to do a wonderful thing for the share prices of 10 or 12 viable uranium juniors. Okay. Okay. So we are we should have uh, more clarity on the term market uh, uh, going forward. It's going to take absolutely two years to do it. Oh, uh, okay. Make no mistake. It's going to take, it's going to take a while for that to occur. Okay. Uh, but the certainty of the outcome is going to be such that I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me to see some investors, myself included, uh, speculate on companies that seem to be the most certain beneficiaries of the term contract market. Okay. Now, going back to the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, like uh, our idiot proof way of doing this over the last three years has been whenever this discount gets like north of 12, we bought. <clears throat> do, do you think, I mean, like right now you can get $22 worth of uranium. Uh, it only costs you 20 bucks. Is that still kind of a viable method, you think? Or, or has things cha have things changed in the market that uh, that's not quite as accurate? I'm not a trader. Uh, particularly, I own uh, a large piece of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, not as large as I used to, uh, because I, I bought the trust at its inception. Uh, I had very, very, very large profits, and I sold enough uh, of Sprott that I have the rest of my position for free. And it's simply not for sale. Uh, I have absolutely no interest in selling it. Um, I... Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the existence of 50 million pounds of uranium, if we actually develop a real shortage of uranium going forward, it wouldn't surprise me to see that be a strategic asset. Uh, certainly, you will have uh, companies, uh, utility companies that haven't engaged in enough purchases in the term market uh, that they have to buy uranium. And if you have to buy uranium as a utility, it almost doesn't matter what price you pay. The cost of the uranium fuel to run a nuclear power plant is less than 5% of the total cost of producing uranium. If you can buy it for 20, you do it. If you have to pay 100, you do that. If you have to pay 200, you do that too. Uh, so I own the Spot Physical Uranium Trust, not because I think there's any necessary upward pressure in the spot market, but because any disruption in the market will drive the spot market absolutely positively crazy. And I'd like to be around for that. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to gold and silver. Um, Ahmed, team player, and a bunch of other people asked, um, ask Rick, what will be the catalyst that gets the miners moving along with gold? Have, uh, have we put in a bottom, do you think, for the miners? Performance. Uh, the miners have disappointed for decades. The malaise in the share prices of the miners, particularly relative to the price of gold, has two explanations. The first is that despite the fact that the gold price has gone up, the costs of producing gold have gone up too. And so the margins that one would have expected with a higher gold price uh, have been more muted than one otherwise would have expected. Inputs like labor, cement, steel, and energy have all gone up faster than the gold price. So despite the fact that the gold price has gone up, uh, producer margins haven't gone up as much as one expected. But there's a deeper and more pernicious problem, which is to say the track record of the mining companies for delivering value over the last 40 years. Uh, certain investors, myself included, remember very well the decade 2000 to 2010, where the gold price went from $250 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce. And the free cash flow per share on the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Stock Index declined. These clowns actually made less free cash at $1,900 gold than they had at $250 gold. And certain investors, myself included, have not forgotten that. It's worth noting that most of the managers who presided over that abysmal performance 
were thanked and excused by shareholders allowed to preside over some other capital destroying activity. But the mining industry needs to regain the trust of uh, investors. They need to be more efficient rather than just grow. When you start to see companies that are being operated efficiently start to generate blowout margins, uh, then you will see the mining sector as a whole uh, come out ahead. I I'm seeing glimmers of hope now in the junior mining sector. Uh, I'm seeing companies like G-Mining, uh, like Reunion Gold, people who have made good discoveries and are making good progress and are communicating that, but particularly people who are doing it, who have been successful in the past. In other words, I'm starting to see a segregated market among the juniors where the very high quality juniors do well, sometimes very well. Uh, but the length and breadth of the junior industry hasn't done anything at all. And it doesn't, it doesn't deserve to do anything at all. Steve, if I can leave your listeners with one thing, it's this. If you buy the sector, over two decades, you will go broke. B-R-O-K-E. If you buy individual companies, if you buy that 5% of the companies whose performance is so extraordinary that it adds, it, it adds legitimacy to a sector which has performed dismally, you will make a lot of money. The gold and silver mining equities business has been a very good business to me. That isn't to say that I haven't suffered some losses. I have. But on balance, I've made an awful lot of money. But I haven't made it investing in the sector. I've made it investing in people and investing in companies that were two standard deviations better than the mob. And that's what your listeners are going to have to learn how to do. If you do that... <laughs> Uh, for two or three years in every decade, you get rewarded extravagantly. When we see a gold bull market, assuming that you're smart enough to trade the market, which most people aren't, uh, you see 300% gains and you see 400% gains. Uh, in the odd alphabet, uh, you see 1,500% gains, 2,000% gains. What's important is to remember the old movie, the good the bad, and the ugly. And learn yourself and discipline yourself to focus on the good and to avoid the bad and the ugly. That's the whole game in the sector. Okay. All right. So the, uh, the costs have gone up, which is, uh, uh, you know, affecting their margins. And um, they... <laughs> They crap the bed in uh, <laughs> before, and and um, uh, they have to regain that trust. Correct. Okay. But uh, the trick is to and pick the. And uh, investors need to learn to segregate. Yeah, pick the uh, pick the winners and avoid the uh, avoid the lo losers, and that's what we got the boot camps for. All right, um, let's talk about the uh, three eight hundred pound gorillas in the room: uh, Newmont, Agnico, Eagle, and Barrick. Um, just maybe a quick uh, overview on uh, on those. For the first time in years, I have good things to say about all of them. Uh, I'm not suggesting that they're cheap necessarily. My criticism of Newmont was always that they'd grown for growth's sake. Uh, and they produced gold from too many tier two mines. The, the combination of their acquisition costs, their depletion, and their site costs were so high that although they produced a lot of money, that they produced a lot of ounces, they didn't make a lot of money. The recent acquisition of Newcrest means that the current corporate strategy, at least as they've discussed, is to sell their tier two mines, use the proceeds from the tier two mines, from the sale of the tier two mines to improve their balance sheet uh, and allow them to focus love, care and attention on tier one projects, projects capable of producing over 500,000 ounces per year uh, in the lowest half of the cost curve. If they do this, uh, I think Newmont will do extremely well. They've announced an initial fleet of six mines for sale, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful goal. These are reasonable quality mines for the right purchaser. Uh, this will go a long way towards reducing the distractions in front of Newmont management and also go a long way to improving their balance sheet, reducing their debt service costs. Uh, Barrick uh, embar embarked on a tier one strategy a very long time ago. The consequence of that is that their production has been falling. That production decline has been arrested. 
And they have announced the move fairly publicly into the copper business, saying the best way to produce gold is producing as a byproduct for copper mines, copper mines being larger. They've taken on political risk, but they've grown with political risk. Uh, and uh, I think we're seeing in Barrick now the fruits of really 10 years of discipline. I think they're really on the runway. The market probably isn't going to respond to Barrick in the near term because most people are nervous uh, about operating mines, even high quality mines, in difficult places. And Barrick is building a mine in Pakistan. Uh, people need to understand that Barrick was built, with the exception of the uh, of the Nevada assets, uh, out of the old Rand Gold assets in West Africa. So they produce they produce gold in places like Mali and the Ivory Coast, Congo, hardly garden spots. Uh, and my suspicion is that the CEO of Barrick will be able to do a wonderful job in Pakistan. There are also recurring rumors uh, that Barrick may end up with Cobre Panama, that big copper gold mine, which has suffered uh, the perils of Panamanian politics. There's nobody I can think of who would be better at negotiating a deal with the Panamanian government than Mark Bristow, somebody who successfully negotiated in Mali, successfully negotiated in South Africa, successfully negotiated in Congo, and now successfully negotiated in Pakistan. If that occurs, ironically, I think in the very near term, the market would sell off because of perceived political risk. And I think if they were able to get Cobre Panama, that that would generate superb shareholder returns for a minimum of three decades. Agnico Eagle just goes from strength to strength. They're the one company out there that hasn't made very many uh, asset, asset allocation mistakes in the past 30 years. Good acquirers, good operators, <laughs> good builders, good capital allocators. And I'm decided to say, uh, I'm delighted to say that they made a very small investment recently, which I think will pay high dividends. Uh, they will be an exhibitor uh, at the Rural Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, this is clearly, in terms of return on capital employed, the star of the league. And I think it continues to be the star of the league. Uh, I noticed too that uh, their uh, large purchases, uh, the Kirkland purchase, uh, really increased their leverage to gold. Uh, they bought some very large operations which weren't low cost operations, thinking that they could improve the operations uh, while simultaneously enjoying the increase in the gold price. I think they're going to be able to do just exactly that. I also think with their balance sheet and their free cash flow that they will be in a superb position to buy anything that Newmont has to sell, uh, particularly Eleanor uh, in northern Quebec, in a way that will be accretive both to Newmont and to Agnico Eagle. Okay. All right. So Newmont is selling uh, a lot of their tier two assets. Yep. Uh, you see that as a uh, good thing. Yeah. The disclosure disclosure of conflict, by the way, as a speculator, I've been selling some uh, Newmont puts. Uh, the stock was under pressure because a lot of the Newcrest shareholders were holding Newcrest for a takeover. The takeover occurred <laughs> when they get paid, they're selling. Uh, I love uh, markets that have been hit for reasons that I understand that I think may be coming to an end. So rather than buying the stock myself, what I've do, been doing has been selling puts. Uh, if the stock doesn't fall low enough that I buy it, I just pocket the put premium and drive on. Uh, that was going to be my next question. In our last interview, you said you were actively selling puts. And so essentially what that means is uh, you get paid a premium, uh, theta or whatever, every day. And yep. uh, if the share price gets uh, cheaper, uh, then you're put to the stock. So you have to buy it and, yep. you know, you get it at a little bit cheaper price. And if that doesn't happen, then you get a little uh, money yeah, in the process. Or, or in this case, I get to buy it. You get to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the idea that the market is willing to pay me to do something that I would otherwise happily do for free is a wonderful circumstance for me. You know, that's an interesting, maybe I should have done the same thing. I just put limit orders going down like every dollar and uh, the last one hit at 30 bucks and now it's back up at 35 or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. And BHP, uh, over the last decade or so, they've been focusing more on copper and then uh, because gold and copper are typically together and getting gold as a byproduct of that, uh, they have taken on some political risk, um, but uh, so far that's uh, working out. And uh, Ignico Eagle, you like them so much, uh, they'll be at the symposium. So 
It sounds Correct. like all three of them uh, are. Correct. I, uh, BHP wasn't what I meant to answer. I meant, I said Barrick. I don't know if you conflated Barrick with BHP. Oh, did I say BHP? Yeah, that was a misstep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Um, all right. Duncan wants to know about AMLO, the president of Mexico. Uh, I guess there's some rumors that he's trying to get open pit mining banned in Mexico, which is not great for precious metals investors. Um, do you see any of this happening? How significant will that be on uh, maybe some of our investments? I don't think that AMLO will be able to get that uh, through the Mexican government. Uh, elections in Mexico between PAN and PRI are fairly hard fought. Uh, and the nominating conventions for the PRI themselves are hard fought. Uh, a ban on open pit mining would be very hard on the states in West Central Mexico. And I think it would be politically damaging uh, to the party in power. It does speak to the hostility that the uh, leftist part of AMLO's government feels. The appointment of the former environment minister who was anti-mining to being the head of the mines ministry speaks volumes for the regard that the mining industry enjoys with AMLO. Mercifully for us, uh, Mexico has term limits. And AMLO is approaching the end of his uh, good riddance. Uh, it does speak, however, to uh, the anti-mining bias uh, around the leftist political elite, the academic elite in Mexico. And I think it's a problem that we're going to have to deal with in the mining industry for a fairly long time. They <clears throat> show, showed their cards uh, when the lithium price uh, spiked. Uh, and AMLO decided that it was in the country's environmental interest somehow to nationalize the lithium industry. The environmental track record of Pemex, the state-owned oil company, uh, is almost comically bad. Uh, and the idea that he said he had to nationalize the lithium business because of environmental concerns uh, is just laughable. Uh, Having said that, as a mining investor, particularly as a silver investor, you have no choice. You have to be in Mexico uh, if you're going to be uh, an investor reasonably represented as an example in silver. And I maintain my Mexican investments, uh, understanding that hostile governments are part of mining. Yeah. Do you still have Fresnillo? I do still have Fresnillo, long-suffering Fresnillo shareholder. I can't help myself. Okay. It's an absolute treasure trove. The problem with Fresnillo is I think that AMLO and his ilk have a, a personal bias uh, uh, against Peñoles, which is the, the senior holding company that controls uh, Fresnillo. These are longtime uh, Mexican aristocracy, and the academic elite holds them in very low regard. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When I read this, when I started looking through uh, all the open pit mines that I've invested in, <laughs> Dolores and all those. Um, okay. Uh, Silvercrest, their uh, report just came out. Uh, the stock responded by jumping uh, over 10%. Uh, yep. what, uh, what updates do you see with Silvercrest? The operations are swimming, uh, you know, separate and apart from all the accounting BS. What's really instructive about Silvercrest uh, is cash at beginning of period, cash at end of period, debt at beginning of period, debt at end of period. That's really proof that the operation is generating cash. That's important to see. What I want to see now is the reserve reconciliation. The reserve reconciliation between the feasibility study uh, and the mine plan was stark. It was truly ugly. Uh, what they said was that their model didn't have enough data to support what was in the reserve study. Uh, they have allegedly been doing a lot of infill drilling, and I want to see how much of that material now re-reports to ore, if any. From a cash flow basis, this company is performing extremely well. What I want to know is how long that cash flow lasts, and that's a function of... <laughs> uh, of reserves. Okay. Okay. So once, once we get that, is there a timetable? I, I, one thing I noticed is they got rid of their debt. I thought that was pretty cool. 
that's a function of the fact that the free cash flow that they report was real. It was spendable. <laughs> that's very important. <laughs> wasn't made up <laughs> you, know, you see you see companies that misstate uh depletion or uh, you know misstate depreciation or, or or something like that uh, there's all kinds of games that they can play with regards to accounting most of which i'm familiar with but there's no substitute for cash at beginning of period cash at end of period debt at beginning of period debt at end of period and net cash which is to say cash in excess of all debt those are numbers that, uh, unless they commit fraud, uh, which I don't think they would do, don't lie. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we got a lot of questions on um, SSR mining, and uh, here's the uh, here's the share price went from about ten bucks, and then just uh, uh, shot down to about four. Um, and the, what happened was for. Uh, anyone that wasn't aware is we had a uh, tailings uh, a heat bleach pad failure uh, which is not great for investors and uh, even less for people downstream of this so just a, a real tragedy what what updates do you have on this one this is um out of turkey uh we're not invested in this but a lot of our uh, listeners are what what do you see uh, coming up with the uh, ssr uh i normally like to buy on horrific news, but I like to buy on horrific news when I have a good sense of the outcome. Uh, the internal discussion in Turkey, and I have some access to very good people in Turkey, uh, is that the Turkish government is considering criminal charges uh, oh. with regards to this failure. It's unusual for a leech pad to fail. And if there wasn't proper ground preparation for establishing the leach pad. And I'm not saying that there wasn't, but if there wasn't proper ground preparation, uh, this is a very, very serious matter. And the fact that people died uh, makes this a more serious matter. I'm not gonna touch SSR until I get a better sense of uh, the case that the Turkish government may be building against uh, SSR. Okay, all right. By the um, way, I'll, I'll keep looking at this. Uh, I am a shareholder of uh, the company, uh, of a company that has a royalty uh, on a mine, Hadmaden, which it, it, which SSR is also building in Turkey. Uh, and uh, any uh, material uh, problem for SSR uh, would certainly impact Sandstorm. Uh, the royalty holder where I'm a shareholder. So it's one that I will continue to monitor, although I'm not an SSR shareholder. Okay. Okay. Like uh, Cote with the uh, uh, Gold Royalty Corporation. Um, all right. Uh, a lot of people also asked about Endeavor Mining and the recent uh, CEO uh, dismissal. That's uh, scary to me. Uh, I know the CEO and I had trusted him my fear, and by the way, this is a pure fear. There's no documentation of this. My fear is that uh, Endeavor may have had to acquire assets in Africa in a way that would be described as traditional, which is to say <laughs> undisclosed compensation. Uh, and this diversion of cash to the CEO may have been in anticipation of just that type of payment. Uh, if people look more carefully uh, at the acquisition of assets uh, by Endeavor uh, in the form of forensic audits, uh, I my spider sense tells me I need to be nervous about that. Okay. All right. Endeavor, Endeavor is, uh, in terms of their ability to discover and build and operate mines in hostile environments, uh, unparalleled. They are truly excellent at it. I'm nervous about uh, the way that they may have exercised their evident political skill in West Africa and whether or not, as a consequence of the termination of the CEO for these payments, uh, a forensic audit uh, in West Africa, even a forensic audit in terms of creating problems which the company would then have to bribe their way out of. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very nervous about that whole process. Okay. All right. And what number would you give them now? 
Uh, right now, I have Endeavor is suspended. Okay. Pending uh, further uh, knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Pending. I don't know enough. I don't know enough to venture a number. I had them as a four. Okay. Uh, and prior to the uh, removal of the CEO, I was considering upgrading them to three, given the stunning financial results that they'd been delivering. Okay. Uh, Boyan, Alpine Stacker, Powerglass, and Wilson want to know about Equinox Gold. Uh, it, there's the test now. We have on time, on budget completion. Uh, if they attain nameplate capacity, they're starting to pour gold. They're starting to process rock. My suspicion is this stock doubles. That's an if. I'm not saying when. It's an if. The stock got cut in half because the last four or five efforts by the industry in Northern Ontario were way behind schedule and way over budget. Uh, and a couple never attained nameplate capacity. So the question was, could the uh, Equinox team complete this task? The on-time, on-budget task is now complete. They're processing rock. They have large stockpiles. Uh, uh, as the mill is commissioned, I would say within six months, we will see whether they can attain nameplate capacity. If they do that at today's gold price, you've got a double. Higher gold price, better than that. Awesome. What what number do you have them at? I have them at a four. At a four. Uh, my oh. bias is uh, I've known Ross Beatty and his companies for many, many, many years. I know this build team fairly well. Uh, my belief, and it's just a belief, I have no evidence of this, is that within six months, they will be at nameplate capacity. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's move on to copper. Um, hot chili. I have a hot chili as a four. The only reason I don't have it as a three is because so far, they don't have a high-grade starter pit. Uh, they have a huge deposit or series of deposits. It's in a wonderful location on the Pan American Highway uh, next to a town that's full of miners. <laughs> they have access to water. They have water permits, desalinated water from the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, they have everything. The only thing they don't have in this enormous deposit is a pod of 1% copper where they can get quick payback. My Belief is, and it's just a belief, that as they continue to explore these very large copper occurrences, that they will find somewhere rock preparation, which allows the concentrations, which will allow a high-grade core. If they do that, I will certainly upgrade it to a two. I'm very bullish over the next five years with regards to copper, uh, despite the fact that Chile isn't as attractive as it used to be. High quality copper deposits on the coast, not at 14,000 feet in the Andes, uh, with towns, with power, with water, with the Pan American Highway. These things are very, very, very rare. Uh, I'm impressed, too, with the CEO of uh, Hot Chili, Christian Easterday, who I've now known for 20 years. The persistence and tenacity of this guy uh, is just absolutely spectacular. Uh, he has rescued this company from almost certain death twice in bad copper markets over 20 years. Uh, a superb human being with a wonderful deposit, but no starter pit. Okay. Um, what about, uh, we've noticed that BHP and Rio have taken a dip recently. Maybe that just has to do with the timing of the dividend, or could it be, um, I mean, copper hasn't gone down. Could it, could it be that Indonesian nickel deposit that's just putting out almost free nickel? Uh, certainly. Uh, both BHP and Rio are in trouble in their sulfide nickel business. But the sulfide nickel business is inconsequential to both of them. A slight softening in the iron price, uh, which is to say a bit of an economic slowdown in China, is what I think is responsible for the softness in the price of BHP and Rio. Rio, of course, is doubling down in the iron business by finally commissioning Simandu, which will be the second largest iron mine in the world uh, after a 30-year gestation period. Uh, BHP and Rio also suffer from a continuing institutional bias towards recession. Uh, a recession, if it occurs, I'm not saying it will, I'm not saying it won't, I'm not smart enough to know, would of course, uh, in the near term, depress prices for a whole bunch 
of mineral commodities. Uh, longer term, I'm extremely bullish on industrial materials, particularly copper. But if you're the world's largest and lowest cost iron producer, <laughs> which these companies are in Western Australia, you will win the last man standing contest. Uh, there will be lots of iron capacity in the world that will go before the Pilbara, before Western Australia, where BHP and Rio generate the majority of their cash. Okay. Um, wrapping up with oil and gas, uh, Mark wants to know about Woodside. Woodside, I'm studying at present. Woodside benefited from the acquisition of BHP Worldwide Oil and Gas Assets. They are alleged to be in on-again, off-again merger discussions with Santos, the other big Australian producer. What you're going to get in either case is a, is a super intermediate, which is, say, a company not quite a major, uh, but much bigger than the intermediates. There are so many moving parts uh, that the harder I look at this company, the more I understand I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know enough to embarrass myself publicly yet. Okay. And David wants to know about Equitable. Uh, he says of possibly entering into a merger agreement by Equitrans Midstream. Yeah. Uh, Equitrans Mid or either Equitable was spun out of Equitrans or the other way around. They are reamalgamating uh, the company, which I think makes sense. Ironically, it might trade at a lower multiple. Uh, but the truth is the amazing free cash uh, out of Equitrans will lower uh, Equitable's cost of capital over time. I'm wholly supportive of this, although in the near term, it might depress the share price. I think it'll make for a much stronger company. Okay. Yeah, we had a limit order that almost hit. And I, I saw that, uh, anyways, this question came up. Um, okay. Oh, one last thing. Uh Rick, where would you go to find out when Russia has sold off its inventories of palladium and platinum? The market will tell you. Okay. Okay. When the, when the biggest seller disappears, the price spikes. That's okay. what happened in 1992. Okay. There's not a there's not a secret website that we could <laughs> <laughs> forecast this from. You know, the, the Russians aren't good at a lot of things, but they're not bad at keeping secrets. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Rick. Uh, we are looking forward to the boot camp and uh, Boca Raton. Any final thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, I once again welcome all of your listeners, if they like what I have to say about natural resources, to give me a say in their natural resources. Go to ruralinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource companies. I'll personally rank them one to 10. I'm about a week behind right now. So uh, allow me uh, a little time. And if you can see my shirt, and if you are uncomfortable with your current ra uh, banking relationships, go see battlebank.com or in the question and comment section at Rural Investment Media, simply write in bank and we'll put you on the waiting list to do business with Battle Bank. Awesome. And a, uh, I can't say enough about your rural classroom. A lot of the questions that were submitted your last Q&A with Albert uh, actually hit on these companies. So if you ask companies uh, that didn't get asked today, go to uh, the Rural Classroom. I'll put a link down in the show notes. You download the app, you literally just get an, a, uh, an alert on your phone when it comes up and you can ask Rick yourself or watch that last uh, replay. And uh, yeah, thank you, for, uh, thank you for being here, Rick. Uh, always a pleasure. Steve, thank you. I'm absolutely delighted that you and your wife are gonna come down to Boca Raton. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at the conference. I look forward to seeing you in the boat cruise. After she goes on the boat cruise, she will love you even more than she does today. <laughs> awesome. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. And to you, thank you for always being here. We'll see you at the boot camp and hopefully Boca Raton for the symposium. $99 for the boot camp. Replay it as many times as you want. And $249 for the symposium online and replay. No better bang for your buck and your bank account. Both links are in the pinned comment below. And thank you for using those links to support the show. Thank you for tuning in. Hit the like and subscribe. And share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about tech stocks. You have yourself a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you next time.